This is uh, your online lecture for today, our first day on earthquake geology. And um, the reason I'm not there in class today is I'm at the 2022 Basin and Range Earthquake Summit, uh, which is in Salt Lake City at the Utah Geological Survey. And so some students and I will be presenting on the Wasatch Faults activity, as well as another fault called the North Genola Fault, which runs along um, West Mountain into Utah Lake. So it's really exciting that we're getting to uh, kind of collaborate with this research group uh, of the Utah Geological Survey, as well as other universities around the area. Uh, a little sad that I won't be there with you in class today, uh, but on Wednesday, um, we will have another day on earthquakes and you guys will get a great chance to ask me lots of questions that you have uh, from today's lecture as well as uh, we'll watch some uh, video visualizations of earthquakes around the world and talk about earthquake hazards and what you can do to pre prepare for earthquake hazards so come with your questions on wednesday okay so now let's go ahead and uh, get started with our lecture. OK, so earthquakes can be uh, quite devastating. And so the Utah US Geological Survey um, has a whole earthquake hazards group um, to help characterize hazards across the US and elsewhere. Uh, so this is one visualization uh, that this sort of work uh, produces. This is a earthquake shaking hazard map across the US. And we can see that the shaking seems to be uh, most potential in uh, areas that maybe make some sense. On the left coast, we have the plate boundaries, right, between the North American and Pacific plate, as well as Juan de Fuca plate on the subduction zone in uh, Oregon and Washington. And of course, we have therefore really high plate boundary motions. We have lots of faults and lots of earthquake hazard. But what this map shows us is that there's significant hazard uh, in other places as well. So like here we are on the Wasatch, we have significant hazard for shaking from earthquakes. Uh, there's other places that maybe seem less obvious uh, to y'all um, that do have significant shaking hazard. So in South Carolina, there was a huge earthquake in the 1700s. In the 1800s, there was a, a series of earthquakes and then what's called the New Madrid Seismic Zone. And then um, and then there's also been a lot of recent earthquake activity where wastewater injection has been going on related to fracking, um, overpressurizing those faults and, and, and resulting in human induced seismicity. Um, some of the other areas of the US, the, uh, Hawaii and then also Alaska have, have a significant seismic hazard uh, because of the hotspot and then uh, subduction zone and transform faults in Alaska. So um, first, yes, earthquakes are produced from motions on faults. So what is a fault? I like to say that a fault is a planar discontinuity or a point of weakness in the Earth's crust. And so these are sites where stress is uh, focused and built up. If the stress exceeds the strength of these weak points in the Earth, these faults, then eventually they'll slip. When they slip, that is an earthquake. Um, that earthquake is not completely um, efficient, meaning that uh, all the all the energy doesn't just go into moving the rocks, but a lot of it goes into shaking, producing heat and, and other side effects. And so when that fault produces the earthquake, we get a lot of seismic shaking that radiates out from it. And if it's a big earthquake, i.e. one that continues to rupture, um, when an earthquake starts, it could just be a few millimeters of failure along a fault, uh, or maybe it'll propagate to 100 meters, in which case it's a very small earthquake, magnitude 2 or something. But if it keeps going up the fault, down the fault, and along the fault, and you really need to think about earthquake as not like a bomb going off on a particular point in the fault, but actually just breaking of this earth over a big area uh, along this plane of weakness. If that keeps going, then it becomes a big earthquake and it can even displace the ground up to the Earth's surface and create what we call a fault scarp, which is shown here in this diagram. 
And here's some examples of fault scarps that have been produced from major earthquakes um, in the in uh, th in this case, it's actually down in Baja, California, um, in the El Mayor Cucapa earthquake, which I believe happened in 2009. Uh, so we see that fault scarp form at the Earth's surface where one side is displaced down and the other side up. OK, so earthquakes uh, produce a lot of hazards. So one thing is that's what we just saw, surface fault rupture and creation of a fault scarp. If you build over that, that is a problem. Uh, but really the most widespread hazard is the extreme ground motions, uh, which in some cases can match the acceleration due to gravity or exceed it. And so what does that mean? Well, stuff flies up in the air, right? Um, that's really bad. Um, usually ground motions are uh, more on the order of 60, 70, 80 percent of gravity, but this is still really bad for buildings, which are really only meant in most case, many cases for a downward acceleration due to gravity. But these uh, accelerations are lateral uh, as well as upwards, not just downward. And so uh, that can result in building failures. Um, also, it can result in secondary effects such as liquefaction, um, where the ground becomes over uh, pressurized and loose sediments become like quicksand. Here's a car in New Zealand which sunk in during a liquefaction event. Um, hillsides can become liquefied and lands have landslides or they can fail along um, landslide planes of weakness uh, as a secondary effect due to earthquakes. Uh, fires can break out in big cities because of broken gas lines. And then also these can get out of control because of lack of water to fight these fires. Um, in some cases, like in subduction zones over here on the right, you can see a drowned forest. Uh, and that is basically due to permanent uh, or at least semi-permanent displacement of the land surface um, when a subduction zone moves out and some areas drop down. Uh, subduction zones, uh, can also result in huge tsunamis because of moving of the seafloor, uh, pushing uh, a massive series of waves um, inland uh, for miles and uh, really destructive. So this was in the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Uh, tens of thousands of people lost their lives in this tsunami. And then afterwards, um, huge impacts like, you know, we are seeing huge impacts from this recent hurricane in Florida uh, because there's lack of water, um, continued flooding and uh, other infrastructure power is out. And in a big earthquake, same thing. It will, um, infrastructure is often gone for weeks or months afterwards, which has major impacts on people and economy. So earthquakes tend to be associated with plate tectonic boundaries. And so here's a map of tectonic plates. Um, and so we sit here on the North American plate, which is actually much bigger than you think, includes goes over to the Eurasian plate, um, borders over here with Japan. It's quite complex uh, in terms of these things. But we think of most earthquakes happening along plate boundaries, but that's not entirely true. Um, we do get plates in the middle of continents, and we'll talk about that today. So earthquake focal depths. Um, so what I mean by that, so uh, most earthquakes happen in uh, certain parts of the Earth. So typically in the upper uh, zero, 0 to 20 kilometers is a normal depth for earthquakes to be occurring. Really, it's kind of uh, doesn't really happen above two kilometers in the Earth's surface. So you have to have enough overburden pressure, uh, usually to initiate an earthquake. So you don't really call it, start earthquakes in the upper two kilometers. And then uh, we have what's called the seismogenic zone um, that runs from about there down to like 15 to 20 kilometers, depending on the temperature of the, of the material at where you are in the Earth. And so that's what we call the seismogenic zone. That's referred to as shallow earthquakes, but really it's normal earthquakes. And so we find these on transform faults, normal faults, the continental crust, um, uh, 
and so on and so forth. The exception, and so just also, the exception is uh, subduction zones. But before I leave this slide, I want to point out that here's the Wasatch Fault. It runs along the base of the Wasatch Mountains in this cartoon showing you that. Uh, the city is out here. Um, the fault dips under to the west and goes underneath the city. Uh, where we'd expect the earthquake to initiate is just about as close as you can get to the city um, at down at depth. That's called the focus of the earthquake, where it starts. Epicenter is the projection of the focus onto the Earth's surface. Uh, but of course, when an earthquake happens, it breaks um, vertically along the fault, but also horizontally. And so you're sliding an entire surface past itself, but not like a block. It's actually radiating out like a, a crack going across your windshield and continuing to grow. Uh, that's an earthquake. Uh, earthquake focal depths can be much uh, deeper on subduction zones. So we guys, you all saw that when you were doing your subduction zone activity. This is where we get deep earthquakes. Um, some of these intermediate depths um, are due to bringing really cold uh, lithosphere down, uh, basically still having seismogenic uh, properties and producing earthquakes. Um, deeper earthquakes are, are probably due to mineral transformations and density changes, which cause a collapse. OK, so uh, continental earthquakes. Um, so on transform faults, these are things like San Andreas Fault in California, North Anatolian Fault in Turkey, um, huge fault systems in the Himalayan uh, plateau. Um, and then also continental rifts, such as what we experience right here in the Basin and Range or in East Africa uh, or um, in New Mexico along the Rio Grande Rift. Um, collision zones like the Himalayan uh, mountains or the Alps, these produce earthquakes. Uh, but we can even get uh, earthquakes in these interplate settings uh, like is shown here in this uh, basin that doesn't really show up much uh, here in New Madrid, Missouri. And that's because that used to be a site of active deformation, but that deformation kind of turned off. It's pretty much dead, but there's still uh, points of weakness in there, which um, certain points in Earth's timeline can be reactivated and have faulting events and earthquakes. Earthquake size, so how do we Kind of, we have ways of uh, talking about the amount of energy released in an earthquake or its size. So um, earthquake magnitude scales are um, kind of aligned to be logarithmic. And so we usually think of earthquake magnitudes going from uh, on the order of earthquake magnitude of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera. But it's really these are logarithmic scales. Uh, just keeping the numbers really simple um, that we communicate to the public. Um, but really, those numbers have um, exact amounts of energy tied to them, and they're logarithmic. So uh, between magnitude 8 and a magnitude 9 earthquake um, is extremely different. So uh, hundreds of magnitude 8s can fit in a magnitude 9. Uh, so um, that's something to be aware of. Uh, we can calculate the uh, energy basically um, that is released or the seismic moment uh, to figure out um, the, 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 the magnitude of an earthquake. And that's just based upon the kind of strength of the rock, um, the size and area of the fault that moves and how much it moved. And if you know those parameters, you can calculate the magnitude. Another way, which is maybe more common that you uh, often hear about, is called the Richter magnitude. And that's looking at these seismograms, basically these little graphs where an instrument is near the Earth's surface and it's uh, getting shaken by the earthquake and recording those seismic waves. Uh, there's a relationship between the size of the amplitude of the shaking and the distance to the fault. And if we know distance to the earthquake, and the amplitude of the waves, um, we can uh, uh, basically estimate the magnitude 
uh, because of the size of those amplitudes. Um, and so that's another way to get at it. That's called the Richter magnitude. But moment magnitude is mostly what's used these days, although there are news reports Richter commonly. Um, they're aligned to be basically the same thing, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, there are many earthquakes, uh, so hundreds of thousands of earthquakes every year or millions. Uh, we can't really detect the small ones very well. We're really good at detecting earthquakes over magnitude two, uh, but the reality is since it's a logarithmic scale, you can have magnitudes of one, zero, you can have negative one, negative two. Those would be like millimeter scale movements of, of the earth. Um, but uh, you know, we don't worry about those because we can't really feel them. Another scale that we can use to estimate earthquake size is called the modified Mercalli scale. That's over here on the right. And that's just basically about perception of shaking in an earthquake. So what did you feel? Uh, and that's pretty important because that's the impacts on the ground. And so, you know, very strong. Here we see MMI of seven. Um, negligible damage to buildings of good design and construction, but small uh, to moderate damage in ordinary construction, um, et cetera, chimneys broken. So if we have a Wasatch Fall earthquake of even kind of uh, significant size, uh, we would expect to have at least that amount of damage, probably much more. That's MMI scale. Uh, so here's an example of the MMI scale. Um, so this was the 1700s Charleston earthquake in South Carolina. And so you can see that near the epicenter, they had MMI of, uh, of 10 and 9. Uh, but that earthquake was felt all the way out to MMI of 2 to 3 in Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Vermont, Louisiana. So it was felt a long ways. OK, let's read. So, so a two or three felt by, by people at rest or on the upper fo floors of buildings, people notice the shaking, basically. Uh, whereas near the earthquake, um, some well-built wooden structures destroyed. Most masonry and frame structures with foundations are destroyed. Uh, rails are bent of, uh, of the railroads. So uh, a 10 is extreme because basically the ground waves, the earthquake shaking is so strong that it's going to bend steel structures and things like that. Uh, really an intense earthquake at the source. Um, many major cities around the world are spatially coincident with seismic hazards. So here's a map of seismic hazard again, and where cities are in black, and we can see some of the biggest urban areas in the world, like in um, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, rivers along the Himalayan thrust front, huge earthquake hazard, you know, millions and millions of people living there. Japan, uh, China, Korea, it has some issues as well. In the US, we don't have as uh, dense of cities, so that's why you don't see as many cities there. This is urban areas with greater than 400 people per square kilometer. That's why our cities look a little smaller because we don't have as dense of cities. Um, so when s earthquakes interact with cities, uh, we can see that uh, a lot of people can die. So uh, this is world population exponential growth. Uh, so from 500 BC to near present, um, people have been having a lot of children. We're getting, we're past 7 billion. I think we're up to near 8 billion today. Um, reaching carrying capacity of the earth. Um, when these big earthquakes strike cities, you can see huge jumps in this cumulative earthquake fatalities curve. So here in the 1600s, I think this is the Lisbon earthquake in Portugal, hundreds of thousands of people died all at once because of really poor building construction. Also, tsunami events can create uh, really impactful situations of death. Uh, and one example of a, a really fairly recent earthquake, the magnitude 7 Haiti earthquake in 2010, uh, caused more than 220,000 deaths. That was 6% of the people that were 
feeling that earthquake strongly died. And that's because the uh, international building codes uh, were not readily enforced in uh, major parts of the city and lots of unreinforced masonry, uh, concrete buildings collapsed on people and caused death. Um, as compared to magnitude 6.3 earthquake, um, with quite a bit of strong ground shaking because it was right below the city of Christchurch, there were 166 deaths in this earthquake, and those were probably due to, again, a lot of um, deaths related to failures of unreinforced masonry buildings, brick, like we have here in Utah a lot. But if you look at the percent of people that died that um, felt that earthquake strongly, it's only 0.04%. So that is uh, two orders, more than two orders of magnitude. So probably 200 times less vulnerable these people were to uh, the earthquake. Um, and that's because mostly the building codes were adhered to. Um, and, and, and so we didn't have a lot of failures, only some old buildings. Uh, the other hazards that can come out from sh uh, things other than shaking can be quite impactful. Like here is the uh, 2011 magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake, more than 20,000 uh, fatalities, um, but those were mostly due to tsunami and not ground shaking. Here's a graph showing uh, deaths in earthquakes by magnitude. And uh, the main thing I want to show you there is between magnitude 5 and 9 on the bottom axis. And then on the top, uh, on the y-axis, you see deaths uh, in each of those earthquakes. And so there's the Haiti earthquake in 2010, 220,000 people died. In 2004, a big earthquake in Sumatra caused huge tsunami. Um, hundreds of thousands of people died. Um, you can see that this is like a, a shotgun scatter. Uh, and that's because, you know, magnitude, uh, even magnitude fives can kill people if the buildings are poorly constructed. Um, although on the other hand, you can, you can have no deaths in those earthquakes if the buildings are well constructed or if the earthquake happens where people are not. And so uh, there's not a real strong correlation between magnitude of earthquake and number of people that died. OK, so we sort of said before that a fault was a, a planar discontinuity in the Earth, which experiences displacement due to tectonics or some other stress. And so when these move, that's an earthquake. Um, and though when it's moving, we call those active faults. So an active fault is one that is within a volume of the Earth that is actively responding to stress. Um, and so we regulate these in places like municipalities in Utah, or in California, building along these faults are regulated. And so um, we regulate that based upon it having evidence of having failed, not within the Quaternary, which is the last two million years, but within the Holocene. And so here's some examples of faults that have ruptured recently, the Wasatch, and then this one that happened in 2010, Elmer Kukaba. So um, the USGS, um, it maintains a kind of national seismic hazard map database, which we looked at previously. Uh, on the left is all the mapped faults that are sourcing that seismic hazard, and they're color coded there by types of fault. Strike slip is red, a thrust fault is black, a normal fault is blue, and gray is uh, not really certain. You don't see many gray ones there, but sometimes it's kind of a mixed mode fault. Um, what is a reverse fault, a normal fault, and a strike slip fault? So a strike slip fault is mostly lateral motion, side to side motions, horizontal motions across the Earth's surface. Whereas a uh, normal fault and reverse fault are what we call dip slip faults. So the faults are not vertical, like in the case of strike slip, uh, but they move and they move up and down. So here we have a normal fault. It's dipping to the left of this image. And uh, that wall that's hanging above the dip plane, we refer to that as the hanging wall. In, in the case of a normal fault, the hanging wall goes down. Um, if we look at this reverse fault, here's the, the fault is dipping in the same direction, this image. So the wall hanging on that fault plane 
in the reverse fold is going up. Uh, and then, so that's why we call it a reverse because a uh, hanging wall is going up and normal hanging wall is going down. Why is that normal? Well, if you think about the force due to gravity, uh, you might expect that uh, a fault should move down on the hanging wall. Um, with the reverse, you have some force that's more strong in the compressional direction, horizontally opposing that and um, pushing the hanging wall up. So it's reverse of what we might expect without that differential stress. So let's look at a few of these. So reverse or thrust fault rupture of the ground surface. So here's our hanging wall moves up. Uh, a reverse fault is steep. A thrust fault would be shallower. Um, and so I don't have a diagrammatic picture of that right here, but I guess this one is kind of like that. So this is, you can see the fault is here. Um, and so here's our thrust fault uh, pushing a uh, big fold and you can see a river cutting through the fold. Uh, here's it, what it might look like on the ground after one earthquake. This was a thrust fault ting earthquake in uh, Taiwan, I think in the early 2000s. Um, and so you can see this is a running track. It was flat before this whole side has moved up two meters. And, um, and so it's like this kind of pushing and rupturing the ground surface like that. That's a thrust fault or reverse fault. Here's some normal fault ruptures. Uh, so this was the Bora Peak, Idaho earthquake in 1983. Um, hanging wall goes down. So this person here with their funny little hat is standing on the hanging wall. Uh, you can see that it had real significant displacement um, in some places uh, over uh, two or three meters high. And here's a, a drainage canal. Uh, again, the fault is dipping kind of under and towards us. And so that is displaced down, hanging all down, normal fault. And here's some strike slip uh, surface ruptures. Um, Guatemala, here's another drainage ditch. Um, in 1976, uh, you can see these people standing there wonder, watching where that fault rupture went through the Earth's surface. Uh, here's another great marker of this road. This is the Landers earthquake in 1992 out in the desert. You can see these Joshua trees. And then 2016, a New Zealand Kaikoura earthquake uh, ruptured right through this house. Look at their driveway. It's a, it's a definite strike slip fault. In this case, so if you're standing on this side with the car over here and you look across the fault, you can see that it moved to the right. We call that a right lateral. Put yourself in the other side of things, standing over here by um, uh, this wider area of the parking. You look across, it also moved to the right. We call it right lateral. Okay, so that's a right lateral strike slip fault. If it was the opposite sense, we call it left, left lateral. So um, this is another map of quaternary faults. Um, and you can see there's many more faults than there were in the National Seismic Hazard Map. And I pose the question of why is that? So the National Seismic Hazard Map is going at trying to understand uh, the shaking risk over some time frame. And not all of these faults are likely to have an earthquake at the criteria that they're worried about. And so that's why there's more maps in this quaternary active fault map. Um, there's a lot of these black maps that have had one earthquake in the last two million years or so. Um, the ones we're really worried about are the red, yellow, and maybe the green uh, faults. So um, that map here shows us that there's a lot of faults in Nevada and Utah. You can also see that some of the faults seem to stop at state boundaries. That's not realistic. It's just different levels of funding for that states are providing for understanding earthquake hazards. Um, but we live in what's called the Great Basin, Basin and Range. Um, and so there's a lot of normal faults here. And it extends between the Sierra Nevada mountains and basically um, the Colorado Plateau and Rocky Mountains over here. It's the area between those boundaries, um, which has a lot of normal faulting. If we go to the left of that, 
we have the San Andreas Fault, a lot of strike slip faulting. And up into the Cascades, we have the subduction zone with the reverse faults. Above the subduction zone, many different types of faults there. Uh, but now we'll narrow in and we'll look at, uh, so within this uh, Great Basin, Colorado Plateau region, look at all those earthquakes in red dots that have occurred. Yellow dots are large, significant earthquakes in the last 100 years. Um, they tend to occur kind of on the boundaries of, um, of this zone of kind of extension. So we can see it running up through Utah and Idaho, uh, along the edge of the Snake River Plain, where the Yellowstone hotspot is, and along the backside of the Sierra, where this WLB is, that's called the Walker Lane Belt. We live along the Intermountain Seismic Belt. The other place that there's a lot of earthquakes is the Central Nevada Seismic Belt. Uh, but there's active faults throughout here. It's just these ones, which are in light gray, are more active. So here's a zoom in of earthquakes in Utah. Uh, over some recent time period. The biggest ones we've had in historic time have capped out at high magnitude fives, almost magnitude six in Utah. In, uh, in Idaho and in Montana, there have been over magnitude sevens, as well as in Nevada. So if you want to say we're kind of absent, what, what we're capable of seeing is definitely over magnitude seven here in Utah, but it, it hasn't happened. Um, since it was inhabited by white people. 90% uh, of Utahns live along the Intermountain Seismic Belt, and population growth in Utah is twice the national average. Um, so in the next 20 years, we're projected to add 1.2 million people in this zone of significant seismic hazard. And so there are currently, and there have been uh, for a while, a lot of uh, employment for people citing developments to ensure environmental safety and uh, avoidance of geotechnical hazards due to landslides, faults, problem soils. And so uh, that is something that geologists can interface with. Um, and it's important, right? So down here at the bottom, uh, you can see kind of surface deformation of the ground. This is in California, 1971 earthquake goes right through this house. Um, there are regulations in Utah and in California to avoid this situation now. And so we want to characterize zones that we build on, make sure we don't put houses right on faults. Here's an example in Seattle uh, where there, maybe you can see a fault structure right here um, in this old area of um, where now is there's like this underground walking tour you can take. Um, this is a part of like downtown Seattle where they lowered the land in I don't know, over 100 years ago. And then uh, some holdouts were there, but this photo was kind of in the gift shop when I was there. And I was like, wait, look, you can see these faults. And so that means there's these fault structures running through downtown Seattle. We can't really see them in the landscape today, uh, but they are there. And we want to avoid those for building upon things. Yeah, and so geologists try to engage with kind of long term earthquake. I would not call it prediction like your book does, but more like earthquake uh, forecasting. And we try to figure out when those earthquakes happen in the past. And uh, how likely they are to happen in the future, which then allows us to create these things like the National Seismic Hazard Map. And so this is called paleo seismology. And uh, this is the type of research that I do here at UVU. So we're trying to figure out when and how much uh, faults moved in the past. And so I've done this on the San Andreas Fault, Wasatch Fault, and other Utah faults, as well as those in um, Alaska and, and uh, Baja, California. So it's been quite an interesting thing. And we usually... Um, study two different types of things. Primary evidence uh, from surface structure at the ground, um, and we'll dig trenches across faults, like you can see here, this person standing, and you might see there's differences in these soils, and we can map those and date the soil layers to figure out when earthquakes happen in the past. Um, and then uh, there's also secondary sh things that happen due to shaking from earthquakes. Um, and you can do that in places like uh, Missouri, which don't show 
uh, faulting at the surface, but have a chance of great earthquakes. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures of some of these paleo seismic trenches and some of the detail works that goes into that. So this is a trench in Alaska along the Denali Fault. Uh, I worked with, uh, this is a graduate student from BYU and they're the lead graduate students from University of Kentucky. Um, uh, we were, he was a UVU student that had gone off to do a master's degree at University of Kentucky. And so again, see these really nice uh, layers of sediment uh, deformed by this fault zone. So we map those out in great detail and, and use uh, dating methods. In this case, it was uh, radiocarbon dating methods to determine when those earthquakes happened. Uh, we engaged in research like that along the Wasatch Fault as well. So I've been working, at, I've worked at this TR site up on the top of uh, Traverse Ridge. Um, and this was a site where they were going to try to put a bunch of developments in. Um, but it was too many landslides and faults, so Draper City took it over for um, outdoor park space and recreation for mountain bikes, etc. Uh, but we studied this in um, some greater detail and determined the last earthquake there was just 200 to 400 years ago, and there was another one shortly there before that. Um, so, so quite interesting to know that um, the last earthquake um, and we see this in a few other trench sites in Nephi and in Alpine and in Draper, that some of the most recent earthquakes were just before um, Utah pioneers arrived here. The average time between earthquakes um, is as a whole on the order of about every 400 years uh, of large earthquakes in the Wasatch Fall. Um, but on any given part of the fall, it might be every uh, 1200 years or so. So here's some examples of, well, how do we recognize faults? So this is in California, uh, intersection between San Andreas and the Garlock Fault. Hopefully you can see really well that there's these discontinuities in the, in the landscape from satellites. And uh, you can also plot um, earthquakes as we monitor them actively with networks of thousands of seismic seismograph stations across uh, the country and we can figure out where the faults are by the earthquakes by the landforms from space uh, or you know getting closer on the ground we can see strike slip displacements like we see here on the san andreas fault at wallace creek this is a 135 meter displacement across a 3700 year old fan um, and that accumulates over many earthquakes, each earthquake having like five to 10 meters of displacement. We can also see um, deformation in GPS stations. So you can see um, this is in Southern California, arrows going in this direction. That's the plate motions as measured by um, these at these GPS locations. And um, you can see that the arrows are bigger on the left and smaller on the right. And there's a big discontinuity in the size of the arrows as you cross what's called the San Andreas Fault. And that shows us that basically one side is running away from the other. That's our strike slip fault. The relative motion across there is right lateral. One really both are going in the same direction, it's just one is one car is pulling away faster. Um, and, and so we can use the modeling of the GPS stations and determine the rate of slip across the fault. We can also do that looking at the geomorphology like we saw here. Um, interesting thing is that the GPS motions so that show that the plates are constantly moving, but at the fault itself, it's stuck. And so this is this principle of what we call elastic rebound. So um, the plates are kind of always kind of bending so like one side is bending but it's stuck at the fault and then in the earthquake it snaps and that's this kind of elastic recovery of uh, as the, as the as the fault fails and so we're basically building up this elastic potential energy as we kind of are moving these tectonic plates and the, and then the earthquake only happens every few hundred years to a thousand years depending where we're at and and then we break and we get the big big event we can see that this has been going on a long time uh, on the san andreas fault we can see uh, different geologic units that are of different ages 
um, have been displaced in some cases 600 kilometers of total offset across the San Andreas Fault. So that's huge. That's like moving, cutting uh, Utah in half almost. Um, it's a lot of motion. Um, that's happened over tens of millions of years. The fault's been active. Uh, a few other things to note. Uh, what we get in terms of shaking depends strongly upon what you're built upon. So if your building is on bedrock, it tends to not shake as much. Uh, bedrock is much more strong. Uh, shaking is less has less amplitude and so therefore less damage. Uh, soft sediments shake a lot more and could potentially have a lot more um, damage with them. Other secondary hazards can be extremely impactful, as we were mentioning earlier. So in 2004, um, just day after Christmas, strong megathrust, so this is a subduction zone earthquake greater than magnitude 9, originated in the trench to the west of northern Sumatra. It was the largest there in 40 years. Um, displacement of the, of the ocean bottom was more than 15 meters. And when that happens, it displaces all the water column above. And it does so, it's not just at a point, but along a whole long area. In this case, it was 1100 kilometer long rupture. And so tsunami waves are generated um, all along that. And um, it basically the tsunami kind of spread out and washed ashore right locally in um, in Indonesia, but also in, in India and other places, it killed people in 10 different countries. Uh, really devastating. So you can see here the kind of after effect of flooding, the waves coming through, and people trying to run out of the way, just how much erosion took place across uh, across these barrier islands and things. 227,000 plus people were killed or never found. Um, 1.7 million people displaced. So tsunamis on subduction zones, um, these are can be these are the biggest earthquakes in the world on subduction zones because remember it dips very deeply and we have a long um, long fault basically it goes through and past the what we call the seismogenic zone. So we get the biggest earthquakes, the most displacement, huge tsunamis. So um, on Wednesday, we'll talk about um, kind of hazards a bit more, and I'm happy to answer greater questions about kind of differences between reverse fault, tsunami earthquakes, um, normal faulting earthquakes, and strike slip earthquakes. But hopefully, um, you know that we can do a lot um, to prepare for earthquakes. And so I just want to say a couple of words about that. So we can't stop earthquakes and we can't predict them, like say they're gonna happen on such and such a date. We can forecast them and say we have a 40% uh, chance over some time period of having them and this is how much shaking will occur. If we know that, then we can engineer buildings to um, deal with it. And so um, there's lots of engineering solutions out there um, just some of them are fairly simple cross beams, rollers, uh, dampeners, uh, all these sorts of things. Like, so our uh, state capital was underwent a billion dollar retrofit, and it sits on these rubber plates that dampen the seismic energy. Um, and so uh, we can construct buildings from the get go now to be seismically strong. We can map the active faults identify areas that are likely to liquefy. We can avoid building along active faults or in these liquefaction zones. Uh, and we have developed construction cones to reduce building failures um, and regulated how uh, things are built, right? So in California and in Utah now, we're not allowed to build right on the active fault. And so you see that, well, the community here in Newport Inglewood has decided to turn that into a park space instead. Um, so they've turned this hazard into an amenity. Other things are happening. So uh, we'll talk about seismology a bit more, I believe, um, but 
I didn't talk about the shaking, right? So there's two different types of waves that are generated in earthquakes, S waves and P waves. Um, they travel in different ways. So the P waves are compressional waves. They travel in the direction of, of the energy. And so they travel fast. They travel like seven kilometers per second. S waves are up and down waves. So they travel perpendicular or they shake perpendicular to the direction of travel. They travel about half the speed. Um, but those S waves and the surface waves, which are even slower, um, are the most damaging waves. Um, we can have networks of seismic stations um, throughout a region. When an earthquake starts on a fault, uh, we can detect those earthquakes nearby the fault. If we have a big network of seismic stations, if the city's uh, 100 kilometers away or 50 miles, whatever it is, uh, we can detect that immediately, potentially um, use the speed of light for transmitting information, send a warning to your cell phone, um, to a uh, nuclear power plant, et cetera, provide an earthquake early warning. It, and, and this is happening now. Um, it's been there for a while in Japan, in Mexico. It's just happening over the last five years in California. It's not yet here in the Wasatch, um, but I would suspect that it will be in the next 10 years. Uh, so what that means is that when an earthquake happens, uh, you may be able to know that the earthquake's coming to you uh, before you feel the shaking. You might get a 10 second warning a 30 second warning, depending on how far you were for where the earthquake started. And I can explain more of how that works. Uh, it has all to do with just velocities of, of these different um, waves and how fast the fault breaks. Um, there's lots of things that we can do. So uh, Salt Lake County has um, established this program called Fix the Bricks. Um, brick homes are great for winds, but really bad for um, uh, seismic energy because they, if they were built prior to the 1980s, they don't have any lateral uh, ground acceleration kind of uh, safety built into them. And so um, basically Salt Lake County has started a, a remodeling, re-roofing um, incentive program for you to make your home more safe and there's lots of ways to retrofit uh, to make make these older buildings safer hopefully utah county will start this sometime soon too um, so push your push your legislators to do so um, and then there's lots of information pamphlets just about how you can make your house more safe make your uh, family more prepared and so i got a link for you there OK, so uh, next class, uh, we will try to talk briefly a bit more about seismic energy and then address questions you may have about all the things we talked about here today. And we'll also watch some videos about some of these earthquake hazards. OK, thanks, everybody. Um, I'll stop it here.